Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What an incredible honor it is to be at Tokyo University and also in uh, the presence of uh, so many august people. Uh, uh, Ambassador Kitioka, the leader of JICA, thank you very much for all your leadership and all your partnership over many, many years. Uh, and uh, so many leading faculty and friends and colleagues. And we're also uh, in the presence of one of the world's greatest scientists, uh, Professor Y.T. Lee, who is uh, visiting uh, Tokyo University, Nobel laureate in 1986 and a great uh, humanist and a great scientist uh, who is uh, one of the also most outspoken advocates for sustainability on the planet. So it's a great pleasure and coincidence to see you here and what, a, what an absolute honor. I was so happy to hear uh, the words of uh, Professor Oki about the determination of this university, one of the world's greatest universities, to uh, use knowledge to contribute to public betterment. And uh, also, I have a tough question from Ambassador Kitioka, which I'm going to take up. So I'm going to depart from uh, a lot of what I wanted to say to talk about a couple of uh, themes uh, instead of some slides. The idea of knowledge contributing to human betterment is one of the most important ideas of humanity. And it seems rather straightforward in a way that when we know something, we should put it to good use. But it's actually one of the biggest challenges in the world. Knowledge and utilization are two different things. Knowledge and politics are often two different things. In my country, they're the opposite things now. Uh, so we have great knowledge and we have politics. They never meet, actually. Uh, they contradict each other. So how to make knowledge work for betterment is one of the most important challenges in our world society. I was thinking back to see when FSI had its meeting with Nature Magazine, 150th anniversary of Nature Magazine. It's interesting, that was also 150th anniversary within a few months of Meiji Restoration. Uh, of 1868. The Meiji Restoration is the most important economic reform in world history. I'm going to explain that in just a few minutes. But one of the aspects of the Meiji Restoration was the idea of putting knowledge to practice because the leaders of the Meiji Restoration understood that for Japan, it would be necessary to mobilize knowledge. This is not normal in politics. That's, this is what made the Meiji Restoration so uh, incredibly smart. And as I think uh, the students here know, one of the first steps of the Meiji Restoration was to send a study mission abroad the Iwakura mission. You couldn't just go online and Google what you needed. You had to go to France, to Germany, to Britain, to the United States to look at other parts of the world. And the Iwakura mission made a careful study of central banking, of public administration, of constitutions, of higher education, of public education and made a very thorough analysis of what do we know? What is the world doing? What are the best practices? And then came back to implement the best practices. And one of the points of implementation of the best practices was this university creating Tokyo Imperial University. 
because that was created in 1877 with the idea that Japan would need a modern university to mobilize the knowledge for development. Well, I've studied the Meiji Restoration for 40 years now because I was lucky as a student to be uh, taught uh, by Dwight Perkins uh, and Henry Rosofsky uh, and other scholars about the Meiji Restoration. And I came uh, actually as a, a visitor to this university 33 years ago uh, on sabbatical and uh, studied some more and realized that it was the most successful economic reform in all of history. And by the way, not only did it create the economic development of Japan uh, and uh, created the only successful industrialization of Asia in the 19th century, indeed actually until after World War II, but it's a revolution that keeps on giving because I think it's right to say that every success in Asia, especially in East Asia, in Taiwan, uh, in uh, Hong Kong, in uh, Singapore, in Korea in the 1960s, and then starting in China in 1978 with Deng Xiaoping's reforms, is actually modeled on Japan's success. Usually when you go to Korea or other countries, they say, we're nothing like Japan. But of course, they're exactly like Japan uh, in terms of what they did, how the government is organized, uh, how a systematic reform was put in place. And it really comes back to the Meiji Restoration, which I think was putting in place the best practices in an absolutely systematic way. And this is what we need to do to achieve our goals. There is actually no limit to ending poverty, to solving the climate change crisis, to having every child in school in the world, to having universal health coverage, all the different SDGs of the 17 are within reach if we can only master putting knowledge to work. This is the ultimate dimension of success. We don't even have to learn all that much more for these goals because what we know can achieve what we need to do. Of course, we want to learn more and more to do better and better, but we know enough now. Let me explain that in quantitative terms. The world is rather rich now in the aggregate. If you look up the size of the world economy, for example, as estimated each year by the International Monetary Fund, the world economy today is about $100 trillion of output per year. There are 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. So the average output for each person on the planet is $12,000 per person. In fact, it's even higher than that <coughs> if you take into account purchasing power. So instead of calculating the size of the economy at market prices, we can calculate the size of the world economy at a set of international prices that reflect the prices in Japan or the United States or other high-income countries. And by that measure, the world economy is at about $135 trillion a year. And so that's a level of about $17,000 on average per person. So the first simple proposition I would give you is that 
whether we're at $13,000 per capita or $17,000 per capita, there's no reason why anyone should be in abject extreme poverty in the world having to live on a few hundred dollars per year and at risk of dying from poverty. We don't need that for two reasons. The simplest is we could transfer enough income from the rich people to the poor people that everybody would be above the extreme poverty line. We could end extreme poverty in not 10 minutes, but 10 months if we got organized because there's no shortage of our production, our output, the global income to ensure that everybody could meet all of the basic needs. The other reason to say this is that the know-how and the technology that we have, for instance, a solar panel that lights a light bulb is one example, or the insecticide impregnated bed net that protects against malaria, shows that we have the technologies to empower poor people to be able to rise above poverty on their own, even aside from giving direct money, we could help to give the technologies that would enable everybody to be productive enough to be above the extreme poverty line. So why don't we do it? There are two basic reasons. One is that there are big barriers that we have to overcome in applying knowledge to problem solving. And that is because of the different systems by which we live. The knowledge system that we live in the universities is very different from the political system in which we organize our political lives. And we need to find solutions so that politics is infused with knowledge. When political science was invented in the Western countries 2,350 years ago in a very good book by the philosopher Plato called The Republic, he had an interesting idea. He said the philosopher should be the king. That way, the gap between knowledge and rule would not be so distant. And indeed, in the Republic, he prescribed a training path 20 years long for the so-called guardians of society so that by the time they came to power, they would know what they need to know to ensure the well-being of the community. This is actually a very good idea. I would like to send the President of the United States back to school <laughs> for remedial education because he doesn't know very much. And he apparently did not learn very much putting his name on buildings in New York. Uh, he did not learn about climate change or other things that he should know about as a responsible individual. I'll tell you a story about these malaria bed nets just as an example about the difficulty of knowledge transformation. I made a phone call to Ambassador Kitioka to help get bed nets distributed. And he made it happen. And I'll tell you the outcome of that in a moment. But there were two issues beforehand that you should know about in terms of knowledge. One part of knowledge was the idea of having a bed net that was dipped in insecticide to repel mosquitoes. That's the real trick of the bed net because a bed net doesn't protect you from malaria just because it's a net because if you sleep under the net and you put your arm against the net, the mosquito finds the way to bite you anyway. So the real trick of the net is that it has insecticide 
on it. It's called excitorepellency. The mosquitoes don't like the insecticide. They don't even want to come close to the net. So a professor of malariology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine experimented with insecticide-treated nets in the 1990s. He was a wonderful gentleman, a real scholar, and a real wonderful human being named Chris Curtis. He was famed among malariologists, all 50 of them in the world. <laughs> Otherwise, nobody knew him, maybe his family and friends, but he was not a known figure, even though he was one of the most illustrious scientists of the time. So as an economist, I don't know very much. So I try to learn by asking people who know something. Uh, it's actually a method that another great, my favorite philosopher, Aristotle, called endoxa, which means that you ask informed people to find out what you should know. And so I was asked by Kofi Annan 20 years ago to help fight malaria. I didn't know much about malaria, but I asked Professor Curtis, who was an expert, and he said to me, you should use nets treated with insecticide. And I said, do they work? He said, yes, we've done many studies. They work very, very well. Then he said something incredible to me. I said to him, well, why don't you go tell the Minister of Health of the United Kingdom? You're in London. You're a leading malariologist. He said, nobody listens to me. And I said, but you're one of the world's experts on malaria. You're right here at the London School of Hygiene. It's just five minutes away by taxi to the Minister of Health. He said, I can't get a meeting. And I said, well, I can because I'm asked by the Secretary General of the United Nations. So I started a bit of a campaign to bring bed nets to people. Then I was very lucky to meet the head of Sumitomo Chemical Company at the time, a wonderful gentleman named Mr. Yanakura, who was the president of the company. He told me something new, which is that the scientists in Sumitomo Chemical had figured out something even better than taking the net and washing it in the insecticide, which wasn't so pleasant for the people to do, and they often couldn't afford to do it. You had to do that every three months because the insecticide would wash out. But the engineers did something very clever they put the insecticide right into the resin that was then knitted to make the net. And that net lasted five years. It became the first long-lasting insecticide-treated net. That's when I called Ambassador Kitioka. I said, you have the best nets in the world, long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. And the government of Japan started to promote the use of these nets. But even then, it was not a simple matter. My government in the United States was against the idea of giving away bed nets. My colleagues in economics were against it too, because economists often have very strange ideas. So one of the worst ideas that economists have is that people value things only if they pay for them. That's a strange idea because rich people like to get things for free, like tax cuts and special privileges. But apparently poor people only like to get bed nets if they pay for them. Not true. Poor people like to get bed nets so they can stay alive, whether they pay for them or not. So I had to argue for several years that we should just give away the bed nets because poor people 
unimaginably for us are sometimes too poor to even pay $5 for a net. Well, the end of the story is a happy end, though we're not quite at the end of the story yet. The end of the story is that in 2008, when Pan Ki-moon became Secretary General, he asked me to stay on as his advisor after I had been advising Kofi Annan, and he said, what is the first thing I should do? And I said, Mr. Secretary General, let's give away bed nets for free. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of people in Africa who live in endemic environments where a mosquito bite can kill them. A million deaths per year of children. And so he thought that was a good idea and made the change of UN policy against the economists' opinions and said we should give them away for free. And the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria began a mass campaign to give the bed nets. And then malaria came down by about 70% from the peak. So the deaths came down from about a million to about 350,000 per year. You can see millions and millions of people have been saved by the leadership of Japan, by the knowledge of how to make the long-lasting bed nets and by the leadership of JICA and the government of Japan and the concept of human security, which said, of course, people should have the bed nets so that they can live. And this has worked. It's almost the end of the story, but not quite, because there are still maybe now 400, even 500,000 deaths from malaria every year. Malaria is 100% treatable using, incidentally, a uh, traditional Chinese herbal medicine called Qinghua So, or wormwood, and the extract of that is called artemisinin. And uh, in 2016, uh, Madam Yu Yu Tu co-shared the Nobel Prize for Medicine for the discovery of artemisinin as a cure for malaria. And that year, Mr. Imura, a great Japanese scientist, shared the Nobel Prize for his discovery of ivermectin to cure uh, worm infections, onchocerciasis and other worm infections. So this is another case of wonderful knowledge being put to use for human betterment. Between the nets and the medicines, we could end malaria entirely. So why don't we? It's hard to understand, actually. But it's hard to make the politicians hear this. So they don't give enough funding to achieve the outcome that we could achieve. Even though the gap of financing is about $3 billion a year to reduce malaria down to almost nothing. What is $3 billion? It is one and a half days of Pentagon military spending. So it would take one and a half days of Pentagon military spending diverted to malaria control, and we would save another 400,000 lives every year and bring the malaria deaths down to zero. But instead, in the US, we are cutting the foreign aid and we are raising the military budget. And that is on the theory that that makes us safer. That doesn't make us safer. That just makes more malaria. That makes more instability. And no matter how much you spend on the military, it doesn't make you safer if the world is unstable socially, 
if the world is beset by environmental crises. And anyway, I can tell you, my country's been at nonstop war now for about 50 years. We're in wars everywhere because we have a big army, so they want to use it all the time. And it does nothing for security. It just destabilizes every place imaginable. I was reading in the paper this morning how Iraq is unstable. It's been unstable since the US invaded Iraq in, 19, in 2003, 16 years. And Afghanistan is in crisis, and it's been in crisis since the US put in uh, the uh, jihadists in 1979 as a trap for the Soviet Union. But all that was trapped was the United States. We've been at war in Afghanistan for 40 years now. Uh, so this is why this kind of misunderstanding by the politicians is so serious. Our goal is knowledge put to use. And knowledge put to use means understanding the science and then making the political decisions to apply the knowledge, overcoming short-term political considerations, overcoming greed, and overcoming vested interests. It's not easy. We're not only rational individuals. We're not only rational uh, species. We are both rational and irrational. And uh, what the great scholars like Aristotle and Confucius and Buddha taught us was cultivate the rational and tamp down the passion uh, so that you get to the right answer. Control your greed, control your short-sightedness, maximize your understanding. So let me come to the Sustainable Development Goals and to China also, because I think that this is a really pertinent issue. The idea of the Sustainable Development Goals, I even have a slide. Uh, how do I? Yeah. We'll just look at them, but uh, just to remember what they are. The world adopted these 17 goals for a reason. The reason is that they are objectives of society that will not be met unless we determine collectively that we're going to meet them. Because the marketplace, the business sector by itself, cannot achieve these outcomes. That's key. All good outcomes in an economy depend on a mix of knowledge coming from universities and scientists, business, which provides goods and services, and government, which directs resources so that we help the poor, protect the environment, help the excluded people, not leaving things just to the marketplace. So the reason that we need sustainable development goals is that the market economy will not solve such problems of poverty, hunger, all children in school, universal health coverage, gender equality, or the other goals unless we decide, use our rational potential to solve these problems use government to tax and then use the resources to direct bed nets to people who need them and so forth. I said the world economy is rich, but it has two huge failures. It is very unequal. So we're average at $12,000 per capita. But the rich countries are at $60,000 per capita, 
and the poor countries are at $600 per capita. Some people have more than they could ever use, and some people are dying because they don't have enough to stay alive. So that's the first problem, and a market system will not solve that problem. A market system will make the rich even richer. And the kind of market economy we have today with a digital economy is what's sometimes called a winner-take-all economy. It's leading to wealth at the top that is even unimaginable by standards of even 10 or 20 years ago. The richest person in the world today, they, it depends on the day, it's either Mr. Gates or Mr. Bezos of Microsoft and Amazon, they each have about $110 billion. That's a lot of money. That's very hard to spend that amount of money, by the way. In fact, Mr. Gates is so rich that in 2010, he was worth $50 billion. And he said, I'm going to give away at least half my money. And he started giving away five, $4 billion a year. He gave away $4 billion a year very generously, and now he's worth $100 billion because the money just keeps multiplying at the top. At the bottom, you are stuck in poverty, in the poverty trap, or maybe even dying of the lack of safe water or the lack of a bed net or the anti-malaria medicine or other or a light bulb, or uh, electricity for refrigerators in a clinic, or other basic needs. The second reason why we have these goals is the environmental catastrophe. Markets will not protect the environment because the environment is treated like a free dumping ground for our waste and because of a bad accident of physics, of quantum physics. You know, the most important invention of the modern world was the steam engine, because it was the invention that brought us modern energy that made the modern world economy. But when the steam engine was invented, nobody first of all, even understood exactly how it worked because thermodynamics was only developed about 50 years later to understand the basic theory of the steam engine. It was a practical design first, and then it became a theoretical design with Carnot about 50 years later. But what was not understood was bad luck. When you burn coal, you create carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide, because of its physical properties, absorbs electromagnetic radiation at the infrared zone, which the Earth radiates. And so if you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it absorbs radiation that normally would radiate from Earth to space, and it warms the planet the so-called greenhouse gas effect. I mention this because uh, Professor Lee's chemistry has a lot to do with this. And uh, he got the Nobel Prize for uh, kinetics, chemical kinetics, kinetics of chemical reactions. And the founder of that field, if I'm not mistaken, was the Swedish Nobel laureate Svante Arrhenius. Uh, who I think was, uh, in a way, the founder of your uh, area of breakthrough. And Arrhenius is very interesting. He won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. But in 1896, he did something quite extraordinary. And that is, by paper and pencil calculation, because he did not have a laptop then, and he did not have a climate model, and he did not have satellite data, but he did know about the spectral absorption of CO2 uh, uh, molecules 
he calculated how the Earth would warm if the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would double. And so he calculated what we now call climate sensitivity, which is if the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere goes from the pre-industrial level before the steam engine to the level now building up all the CO2 because of all the coal, oil, and natural gas that we burn, he asked what would happen if the CO2 doubled. Now we know now that it, that means going from 280 parts per million of CO2 to 560 parts per million of CO2. And he calculated almost exactly right in 1896 that that would lead to a three to five degrees Celsius increase of temperature. The current preferred point estimate is three degrees Celsius, the lower bound of what Arrhenius calculated. It's one of the most amazing calculations, I think, in history, given the timing of that. Well, one could say we've known about this risk of climate change for a long time, except for all the problems that I told you about of knowledge and politics, because this has proved to be a very difficult problem for exactly this challenge. Now, Arrhenius made one basic miscalculation. He said it would take 750 years for human beings to double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. You know why? Because he didn't count on China. <laughs> because he didn't understand that China would become the industrial superpower of the world in a short period of time. And so he did not understand geometric growth in economics, though he was pretty good at numbers. And it looks like now we'll double the CO2 concentrations not in 750 years, as he wrote in his 1896 paper, but in 150 years, roughly from 1900 to 2050. That's the path that we're on right now, roughly speaking. And it could be catastrophic, because now we understand a lot more than we did in Arrhenius's time about what a three degree Celsius rise would mean. And I would, I would bet, Professor Oki, that the damages are even higher than you showed in the figure. Because if we were to reach three or four or five degrees warming, we could end up with devastation of our crop production. We could end up with massive new diseases that are temperature regulated. And one fact that we now understand also, thanks to the study of the Earth's history, the paleoclimatology, is that with the warming that we have already made, a little more than one degree Celsius, we're already in the range of disintegration of the ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland. So we could have, within a century or two, an eight meter sea level rise. Now, hundreds of millions of people live within that range. It's now estimated that hundreds of millions of people will experience daily flooding even by the middle of this century because of sea level rise. So we're on a catastrophic course for environmental destruction. This is why we have these goals, because our economy does not function for human well-being neither for fairness nor for environmental sustainability. Governments don't agree on very much, by the way. It's very hard to get governments to agree on things. So if you have an agreement where all 193 governments of the UN have agreed on something, you should take notice that maybe there's a reason for that. And the reason is everybody 
except for Mr. Trump, <laughs> is scared because they know how dangerous the situation is. That's why they agreed on these goals in September 2015. And a few weeks after agreeing on these goals, they also agreed on the Paris Agreement to aim to hold warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius at a maximum. Even that level is very dangerous. We're already at 1.1 degrees. We're going to need decisively to change our energy system if we're going to stay below 1.5 degrees, as we have said we're going to aim to do. So this is why these goals were adopted. What to do? The main idea is to think how to achieve the goals. This is hard work. It's the job of universities. That's the core job, teaching and thinking. It's not the usual job of most governments. My government, the United States, doesn't think at all anymore. Honestly, I mean it literally. It acts, it operates, it sometimes takes decisions. The president makes decrees, he makes tweets in the middle of the night. But no thinking. We don't have any studies anymore. We don't do any analyses anymore. And if a scientist thinks in a government agency, the scientist gets fired now or told you can't publish anything. It's very dangerous, actually, what's happening in the United States. It's a kind of attack on knowledge. Why is that? Well, because our political system became very corrupt, dominated by money. Our election cycle costs about $8 billion a year. So what do the candidates do? They call the rich people all the time. Or now we have more and more billionaires just running for office directly so they can spend the money on themselves. I don't think Donald Trump spent much money because I don't think he's really a billionaire. I think that's why he's hiding his tax returns. He's also a cheat, tax cheat, but he's probably not a billionaire like he says, but maybe Michael Bloomberg is going to run for office as a billionaire and Tom Steyer is running for office as a billionaire. This is a bad thing in politics. Plato said, by the way, that the philosopher king should live less well than the average people. They should live very modestly. Uh, maybe just a tatami mat, nothing more. Uh, they don't need Big luxury, said Plato, because luxury will corrupt them. And this is what's happened in the American political system. And so we have politics governed by Chevron, ExxonMobil, ConocoPhillips, the big oil companies, not by the need of the population. So the idea of sustainable development is use the goals to think to draw a roadmap, to make a plan. The idea of planning went out of fashion, but we need plans. Japan plans very well when it wants to and should plan the energy transformation of this country. So the basic idea is we need at the global scale to cut the emissions from CO2 as shown in this picture by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We're emitting 40 billion tons of CO2 per year right now, and by the middle of the century, that needs to be to zero. We need to decarbonize the energy system. That is an intellectual puzzle, how to do that. Basically, we know the answer. Renewable energy from wind and solar and hydropower and geothermal energy and ocean currents 
Maybe nuclear energy, you know all of the pluses and minuses of that. It's zero carbon, but it has big risks. And then use the renewable energy to run the economy. Our cars should not run on petrol. They should run on electricity or run on hydrogen made by electricity. Our buildings should not be heated by burning coal or oil or natural gas, but should be heated by electricity. Our industry should be run with electrification or with synthetic fuels made by electricity, by green chemistry. There are many ways that we could make synthetic hydrocarbons, for example, for the airplanes using carbon dioxide from the air, using renewable energy, using hydrogen made by splitting water, and then combine the carbon and the hydrogen and the energy, and you can make, the chemists can make anything as long as they have enough energy to do it. And so we need uh, better chemical processes for the green chemistry, but this is what needs to be done now. So yesterday, in meeting with Sumitomo Chemical, I told them, you solved malaria before, now you have to solve green chemistry. So uh, now you have to make uh, uh, synthetic fuels that can run the economy. And Toyota has to make the best electric vehicles in the world, or the best hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in the world. And Japan has specialized in energy efficiency over the last 25 years. So Japan has found how to get the most out of the least energy inputs. And that's an extremely valuable technical knowledge also for making it easier to decarbonize the economy. But Japan does not have a plan to decarbonize right now. The politicians don't like to make plans. It holds them accountable. Or maybe the information is not pleasant for the population. But actually, people want to know about their future. They want to know what is the solution. So I urged Minister Koizumi yesterday when we met, make a plan for decarbonization of the Japanese economy. Now, let me turn finally to the question of China, uh, because it's relevant in many, many ways in everything we're talking about. First, China learned from the Meiji Restoration, actually 110 years later, because China had a very bad stretch of history from 1839 until 1978. Japan was involved in that. But it started in 1839 when the British Empire had the very arrogant idea that it had the right to export opium to China and that the Chinese authorities did not have the right to stop British merchants from selling opium to the Chinese. Imagine if narcotics warlords showed up to the United States or to Japan and said, we're going to import cocaine and heroin whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, we're going to go to war with you in Edo Bay. That's exactly what happened in 1839 in the Opium Wars. It's probably the most disgusting, arrogant war I know of because it was a war for narcotics trade. And the British won the war, and they won for one major reason. They had the steam engine, China didn't. Actually, China invented the steam engine, by the way, in the year 900 in the Song Dynasty, but it didn't commercialize it. And so it was on the receiving end, not the giving end, by 1839. China lost two wars, and then in the 1860s, there was an internal rebellion, the Taiping Rebellion, 
which devastated China. Maybe 50 million people died. We barely even know about it. But it was one of the greatest upheavals in modern history. It devastated Chinese society. Then the Western powers continued to encroach. Then Japan industrialized and became more powerful than China. And Japan fought wars with China and won at the end of the 19th century. And the European powers came and insisted on extraterritorial rights in China in, 19, in 1899, 1900. We were just in Shanghai last week on the Bund, which was where the Western powers built their luxury villas. And this ended up causing a revolution in China when the uh, Qing dynasty was unable to reform in 1910. But it was a failed revolution because by 1916, China was with warlords and internal civil war. Then after the unfair Versailles Treaty, there was a more political unrest in China and the Communist Party was formed and that led to the beginnings of civil war. Japan invaded China in the 1930s and in the 1940s more civil war and then the People's Republic was established in 1949 and the first model was the Soviet Union, which was a very bad model of development. And by 1958, Mao was getting very uh, unhappy at uh, the pace of change, so he said we should accelerate change by turning every farmer into a steel manufacturer in the Great Leap Forward. And that led to 25 million deaths from people starving because they couldn't eat the steel they were making in the backyard. And then that led to more upheaval and Mao launched the uh, Cultural Revolution in 1966. And that was 10 more years of upheaval. And then Mao died in 1976 and then Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978. I mention this because that was 140 years of chaos, of collapse. You can't imagine a society falling more from what was a leading world society to a collapse. 140 years of internal rebellion, several lost wars, civil war, horrible economic policies. So 140 terrible years that left China completely impoverished. And in 1978, 90% of the country was peasant farmers impoverished. That's the starting point. And then Deng Xiaoping made brilliant reforms definitely the most successful economic reformer in history, but using the results of the Meiji Restoration because the model of China was Japan's development model in many, many specific ways. And this is, a, I think, a, a tribute to a model now that has made East Asia an economic powerhouse. So for 40 years, China grew from impoverishment to ending poverty this year. Basically, extreme poverty is down to zero as of 2019. I regard this as a phenomenal success. I also think we should see history through China's eyes. I think the Chinese authorities main idea is we don't want any divisions again until we're strong enough. Because the last time we had division and weakness 
we lost everything. And I think that this is the basic idea that we don't want to be divided. And the main message that China gives all the time is don't interfere in our internal politics. But to understand that, that sentiment, I think one has to understand the history from 1839 until today. And I think China's sentiment is made much more complicated by the United States now because the United States is now an unstable country in the world, unfortunately. And what the United States policymakers are saying is very, very dangerous. If you read the US policies now, they're saying China is an enemy. China is out to undermine the United States. I don't believe this for a moment, by the way. I truly do not believe China is an enemy or that its goal is to undermine the United States. Nor do I believe what we write in every official document that China is antithetical to America's interests, trying to undermine American prosperity. I think that this is a bad tendency in America to exaggerate, exaggerate the evil of other countries. We did that also even in the Soviet Cold War period, exaggerating tremendously the challenge. So I don't view China as an enemy, but I do view China as a uh, country that for historical reasons, wants no interference and wants to become strong. Now, the question is a fundamental question. What is the goal? Is it world domination? I very much doubt it. I think the goal is to recover from weakness of 150 years and from poverty. And I take note that China still today is in market terms probably uh, a half or less of Japan's per capita income and uh, in the, even less than that in the United States for, compared to the U.S. about a fifth of the U.S. per capita income. In purchasing power terms roughly a half of the U.S. per capita income but still a lot of development ahead and many, many challenges to clean the economy, to stop the pollution, to decarbonize the energy system, to manage a continued transformation of hundreds of millions of people from the countryside to the urban areas. It's a huge, huge challenge. And in the meantime, like Japan, society's getting older. That poses many challenges. Japan and China will be two of the oldest, highest median age societies in the world. I think that's good. Older people like quiet. I don't think older people want to take over the world. I think older people want quiet. That's at least my own introspection. Quiet, that's nice. Uh, and I think that that's really important. So my view of China is, first, there is no determined future for any country. Is China an enemy? I say no. Is it a threat? Mainly if we make it so. When the United States tells other countries, don't buy Chinese goods, don't buy Chinese technology, we come closer to making China an enemy than solving a problem. If we have an open relationship, a mutually constructive relationship, then I think it becomes much more likely that China becomes a constructive partner over time and loses the darker side of the excessive fear of China also. But China's fear 
is a little understandable when the U.S. policymakers are saying, oh, we should contain China or stop China's technological development or tell our allies don't buy anything from China. Because from the Chinese perspective, they say, you see, we told you, they are trying to stop us from having a normal life. And that, I think, is a big risk. Let me read you just a, one wise statement by President Kennedy, who was a very wise statesman in the last year of his life in 1963 when he was campaigning for peace with the Soviet Union. And he said in a speech to the Irish uh, parliament, he said, indeed, across the gulfs and barriers that now divide us, we must remember that there are no permanent enemies. Hostility today is a fact, but it is not a ruling law. The supreme reality of our time is our indivisibility as children of God and our common vulnerability on this planet. And what President Kennedy was saying was, don't consider any country an unstoppable foe. Don't consider any country an enemy. Understand the points of view, the interests, and find a way for mutual accommodation. And it's interesting that President Kennedy said that in July 1963. He was campaigning for peace with the Soviet Union. And he did a beautiful job because he explained we should not be enemies with each other. We should understand each other and make peace. He gave a wonderful speech in June 1963 called his peace speech, where he said, we should make peace with the Soviet Union. And the biggest obstacle, he said, is not the Soviet Union. It's our own attitude. It's our own belief that they're so evil, we can't make peace with them. And when he gave that speech, the head of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, called the American envoy, Avril Harriman, and said, that is the finest speech of an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. I want to make peace with your president. And six weeks after he gave that speech, the US and the Soviet Union signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. This was a moment of incredible hope. Many people think President Kennedy was actually killed by right-wingers in the United States who opposed the peace initiative. This is certainly a possibility. But what President Kennedy showed in these last months of his life was you could make peace with someone that you regard even as your foe. So my view, my real view is that China and Japan and Korea are three technological powerhouses of Northeast Asia that have so much more to gain from cooperation than from conflict. If you put the three countries together, this is the most powerful technological zone of the entire world, more than the United States, more than the European Union, the three working together. Japan knows so many things that China needs. Because if you go to a Chinese city, it's dirty and it's polluted. And if you go to a Japanese city, you can eat off the ground. <laughs> I have been here three days. I haven't found one scrap of paper where it shouldn't be. I thought I found one, but then I looked. It was just paint on the sidewalk. <laughs> There's not a scrap of paper here. Where do you put everything, by the way? I don't understand it. In New York, the garbage is out on the streets everywhere. If you walk down the streets, it's big black bags of garbage everywhere. I can't even find a garbage can here. People put it in their pockets or something. Or you don't even have waste. So Japan figured out 40 years ago how to make cities clean and efficient. 
I don't even, I, I know it's naive, but I haven't been in a traffic jam here. Is it, uh, there may be, but I've not experienced it. The traffic just moves. Why? How? Anyway, you figured out something. China has 130 cities of more than a million people. Everyone needs Japanese technology to be clean, clean air, energy efficiency. The connections are so strong if the security and the politics can be made to work. And in the meantime, I'm afraid the United States is saying, don't go there, don't go there, you're on our side. Because when you're an imperial mentality, it's always division. But we need cooperation more than anything in this world to solve sustainable development goals, especially cooperation of neighbors. Because the energy system, the pollution, the fisheries management, the infrastructure depends on cooperation. Even China's initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative, to build infrastructure from East Asia to Europe, how much better will it be if Japan is part of the building of the infrastructure, is a partner? The United States says, oh, don't touch that. That's China. They're on the other side. But suppose that it was a partnership so that clean, energy-efficient solutions were part of the infrastructure provided by Japanese companies. So I don't want to be so naive as to say there are no problems, that there's no tensions, and so on. But I don't want to exaggerate the tensions or to say that China has a fixed path, that it is irrevocably you know, a, uh, a society that uh, is cruel and so forth. I don't believe it. I started, we came, Sonia and I came to Japan and China for the first time 38 years ago. We fell in love with this country completely. Uh, and uh, we went to China in 1981, just after we were in Japan. And everybody was in Mao suits and on bicycles, if they had bicycles. There were no cars, there were, no, there were few military trucks. It was impoverished. There were no shops except one shop where the tourists went that had nothing in it that you wanted to, to buy. And China is a much, much, much freer society. It has solved the problems of poverty. Millions of Chinese are tourists around the world. Chinese students are all over the world. This is wonderful. This is a complete progress in 40 years. This is not a society that is in lockstep on some kind of cruel mission in the world. This is a society also finding its way with many, many challenges. So I believe that the best answer for all of us is cooperation and partnership. Thank you very much.